in the foundation, we talk about carbon efficiency, which is minimizing the amount of carbon per whatever unit, per value that you're providing to the end user. And I think there's multiple ways you can think about that because you can actually think about fundamentally changing the nature of your application so that you can actually provide the same value without even needing the same functionality. And I think that's kind of the way we need to really think about this stuff. Hello, and welcome to Environment Variables, brought to you by the Green Software Foundation. In each episode, we discuss the latest news and events surrounding green software. On our show, you can expect candid conversations with top experts in their field who have a passion for how to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of software. I'm your host, Chris Adams. Welcome to this week's episode of The Week in Green Software, where we bring you the latest news and updates from the world of sustainable software development. I'm your host, Chris Adams, and in this episode, we have some exciting announcements from the world of energy standards for software and, yes, even Web3. We also bring you some exciting upcoming events. Before we dive in, though, let me introduce our participants for this episode of This Week in Green Software. With us today, we have Anne. Hi, Anne. Hello, Chris. And we have Asim Hussein. Hey, Asim. Hi, Chris. Okay, so if you don't know Asim and Anne, maybe we should they should introduce themselves. I'll hand over to you, Anne, first, if that's okay, because it's alphabetically ahead of Asim. And then we'll head to you, Asim. So, Anne, for people who've never met you, how would you introduce yourself? So my name is Anne Curry. I've been in the tech industry for nearly 30 years and I've been an engineer and various other things. And the past six or seven years, I've been doing quite a lot on sustainable software. I work for a company or I work with a company called Container Solutions and I am one of the co-chairs of the GSF Community Committee. Cool. Thank you, Anne. And Asim, over to you. I really respect the going via alphabetical order. If you go to the Green Software Foundation website, you'll notice that all our companies are listed in alphabetical order. So as uh, to be fair. So my name is Asim Hussain. I'm the Executive Director and Chairperson of the Green Software Foundation. One of the ways I used to describe what I do there is I'm in charge of the GSF operating system. I'm like Linus Torvalds, but for the GSF operating system, that's who I am. But I'm here to help all the wonderful people like Anne and Chris and everybody else involved in the foundation build their amazing solutions and help them to execute what they do. Cool. Thank you, Asim. All right. My name is Chris, as I said before. I am the executive director of the Green Web Foundation. I work with the Green Software Foundation as their policy chair for the policy working group. And I also help run a small community online called climateaction.tech, which is passed recently 8,000 techies working on climate and tech in this particular intersection. And uh, yeah, that's what I've, that, that's the thing I do. And that's the milestone that we've passed recently. But before we dive in, we should just stop and I've just got to make you all aware that anything we talk about today, we'll share links. So if there's something that caught your eye, if you go to podcast.greensoftware.foundation, you will see some links specifically to those stories. Okay, so I guess with that, folks, should we start looking at some of the news and see what's showed up in the news this week? Yes, let's do that. Okay, so the first one we have here is how slimmed down websites can cut their carbon emissions. This is a story from the BBC. And this is the first time, it's actually one of the set, the BBC has some is some form in looking at this stuff. But this is a recent story that came out in the last week or two, actually. And uh, I might hand over to either Anne or Asim, who've got some reckons on this one, because it's quite nice to see the BBC looking at this, but there's always more to this story than what you actually just see just here. Chris, it's, it's interesting you've handed over to us for the reckons on this, because you are literally the world expert in this particular field, are you not, as the chairperson of the Green Web Foundation, which is entirely devoted to this very subject of how you make the web less carbon intensive. I think Chris is being humble. So, <laughs> <laughs> Humble aside, Chris, what do you think? What do you think about this? Because you know what, if I was ever asked, I would just forward the request and ask Chris what he thinks and then mirror that statement out to anybody Indeed, else. Indeed, so would I. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, I think I can actually point to is that that's nice of you to say. Although I work at the Green Web Foundation, there are lots of other groups who are mentioned in this. One of them is the Eco-Friendly Web Alliance, which I'm not so familiar with, but some of the other names, Whole Grain Digital and EcoGrader are both listed in here. In this, they talk about some of the tools that you can use to basically 
estimate the environmental impact of a website by looking at how much data is sent over the wire. Now, the thing that I should share with you is that this is one way that you can get a rough idea of what the environmental impact for a website might be, but it's also useful to bear in mind the phrase that all models are wrong, some models are useful. And we maintain a library called co2.js, which helps get some of these kinds of conversion factors. So if you know how much you're using something, you might get an idea of what the environmental impact might be. But there's a lot more to just looking at the data that's sent over the wire. And I think I might hand over to one of you two here because there's a few other things that I can tell you about, but I want to make some space for either of you because I'm pretty sure you have some questions at this point. So they talk in this particular article or the show about how the highlight of the story is how a UK knitwear designer was trying to do everything else with her business to be environmentally friendly, sourcing surplus yarn. Everything is made to order using hand-powered knitting machine, but not being aware that her website emits nine, was it 9.89 grams of carbon every time a user visits her homepage which is 10 times the eco-friendly Web Alliance's recommended limit of one gram. So that's an interesting aspect of it all, which is like you, you've got this person who's building this business. Interestingly, just as a slight aside, my wife is also a UK-based <laughs> knitwear designer. And literally yesterday in the evening, she actually was spinning her own yarn using one of those oldie style like foot things. That's what she does. So this is, this is we'll, we'll definitely watch that show. But yeah, it's interesting. So... You're doing all this stuff in your life, but you don't realize that your website, the thing that you're selling your product, actually has carbon emissions as well. I think, so Chris, you were mentioning something before we hit recording. You mentioned something about how it was like people just realizing that your digital aspect of your business is almost just completely ignored. You don't even think about it. And I remember like there was, there was some a, a video that came up to my radio the other day, which was just a bunch of young guys sitting around talking to each other. And one of them going, did you know you can edit the internet another one going yeah do you know you can go to wikipedia and just edit a page <laughs> no way you can edit it so getting that <laughs> accepted <laughs> but it was like i feel like that's maybe the statement that's coming through from this show is oh did you know by the way that websites also emit stuff they have and there's things you can do to reduce that and it's that realization in people's minds that this is actually an important aspect of their total emissions footprint this is true in that, yes, the energy has to come from somewhere. That's definitely the case. Now, whether a website being 10 times the size of another website mean it, it means it has 10 times a carbon footprint, that's another matter. And I see you shaking your head. So I think I reckon you've got something to share before I come in on this one as well. Yeah, there are loads of factors, operational factors to take into account when it comes down to that. There's where is the power coming that is powering the servers that are hosting that machine, for example? is Are you hosting somewhere where everything's green, all the power's green, in which case, you know, fill your boots, it's fine. Are you delivering content at a time when basically everything's green? So maybe only business content and therefore you're not really serving up at peak times, for example, in the evening when people are at home. If you're a very popular website, then you might be using CDN, you might be caching your data. And in fact, the more popular you are, the more likely the data is to be cached somewhere close to the edge. So your website doesn't even hit when the big images are pulled. So yes, there are loads of factors that are not just about whether you've got a really heavyweight framework that's serving up your web pages, although there are bad reasons for that as well. There are accessibility issues associated with very heavyweight web platforms as well, because often they do not have the accessibility features that basically an HTML-based website would have. So there are lots of issues and lots of questions. It also depends upon the value that your website is providing to the end user as well, because there's 10 grams per sending some life-saving medication to something. It depends on the value it's providing as well. I'm sure we can always like sure all of our products are as efficient as possible, but that is the one way I really talk about it is in the foundation we talk about carbon efficiency, which is minimizing the amount of carbon per whatever unit, per value that you're providing to the end user. And I think there's multiple ways you can think about that because you can actually think about fundamentally changing the nature of your application so that you can actually provide the same value without even needing the same functionality. And I think that's kind of the way we need to really think about this stuff. Thanks, Patu. All right. So the thing I might share now is, yes, I agree with all these things. Accessibility is absolutely a factor that gets played into this because there's actually studies 
And there's evidence showing that basically designing a digital service in a particular way can basically lead to induced updates. So people being forced to have to upgrade from, say, an old phone to another phone and something like that. Mm, that's and you bear in mind. And yeah, exactly. There's actually a really good study that was shared at a conference called the Limits Conference where people were looking at the devices that were being used in various distance learning tools. And you could see very quickly at a certain point how just certain devices just stopped showing up in the analytics at all, simply because they were being, essentially, they, the, the site was no longer accessible to people. And given that around 75% of the impact for most devices is actually from the manufacturing, not the use, this is one of the big leverage points, actually. If you are interested in this, there is actually some work from the Green Software Foundation there is actually a training course for this. My organization, we've recently published a handbook for community tech specialists who are basically taking their first steps into this. But the thing to bear in mind is that it doesn't automatically follow that a website being 10 times the size is 10 times as bad for the environment. It really doesn't necessarily work like that. It's useful to start, but there are tools to, for you to get a much better idea and really observe directly where the energy is being used in the system. But in order for you to do that, you do need to have a bit more transparency through this. And because the internet is made up of so many different companies, that can be quite difficult. And the story of transparency and companies, when you're trying to understand where the hotspots are in digital services, is a perennial one. But this is actually one that is actually getting better in that there are companies like Microsoft and Amazon and Google who now expose some of these metrics to end users there is a very significant percentage, I believe it's safe to say, like greater than 50% of all the energy. So if you think of like using laptops, what is the application that's actually being used the most on a laptop? Like we think it's like the actual things we install. It's not, it's the browsers. So that's why websites are so much more significant than we maybe give them credit for because a significant portion of the energy from a desktop is, be oh, from a laptop desktop is being used to just to browse websites. I think the mobile, I've heard a slightly different story, which is that mobile users, people tend to still install things, but then they probably still install, there's lots of technology now where you're installing effectively a web app, but it's an installed thing. So I think like the web is, at least in terms of end user devices, probably the most significant consumer of electricity. I'm guessing here right now. And I'm also guessing that on the server side, that's not going to be the case. It's probably going to be something more like a numerically computational, like machine learning thing or something. I don't know. So here's one thing that might be of use. So we spoke about the Firefox browser having some of these metrics because they basically, the people who build the Firefox browser set a target to make it the greenest browser possible in order for them to do that, they need to see where the actual impact is taking place. And I don't know if any other browser that provides the same level of detail right now into this. And it'd be really lovely to see the other browsers doing this to expose those kind of metrics out there. But this is probably one where you can find out so we could actually see which applications are doing this. Now, in Germany, at least, there is some work going on to start providing a kind of labeling system for various processes. And uh, one thing that was shared at FOSDEM, a recent kind of open source conference, was essentially comparing an open source word processing tool and a well-known proprietary word processing tool. And basically, you got a, a document open. The actual blinking cursor was basically one of the things that ended up causing a massive spike in CPU every single time and again. And again, it might be fixed now. If you look up the project called Soft Aver, in, in, and I'll share the link for that, there's a bit of information around it. And the folks at, oh God, KDE, they have spoken about this at length. And there's a really nice talk at FOSDEM about specifically this stuff. We'll share a link to it. Okay, so what's next on our list? There's another one, Amazon sustainability work. This is a story in Computing Weekly. And the short version, the headline is basically, Amazon denies claims that hiring freeze is slowing AWS sustainability work. And uh, as I can see it, basically a number of high profile people left the sustainability team within Amazon. And that's led to a number of people who are downstream as consumers or customers of Amazon thinking, oh Christ, what's going to happen with the actual metrics? Is it going to keep developing at the speed it was? And given the size of Amazon, this is probably quite a substantial story, basically. Yeah, it does really matter. What the hypercloud providers do really does matter. And it sounds like AWS have, they, they had a bit of a 
they moved forward. They did quite a lot, but now suddenly they seem to be falling back behind Azure and Google again. They're still making good progress, apparently, on sourcing green electricity to power the data centers. But in terms of that whole architecture, so it was two years ago now, I think they announced the sustainability architectural pillar which was an indication that everyone needs to actually start thinking about how to. We, as Amazon users, we were responsible for the sustainability of our own systems within the cloud. So AWS said they'd take responsibility for the cloud, but we had to be sustainable within the cloud. And that really meant things like using serverless, using spot instances, that kind of thing, just being more efficient, turning things off when you're not using them, all that kind of stuff. And they had quite a focus on it but lots of people have left. And now there seems to be much less of a focus on it. And the thing is that with Amazon, the reason why I'm animated about it, because there's something we can do about it, because Amazon are very focused on customers and customers saying they want it. So here, if we want that to get focus back again, and it is important that it does have focus, we need to be telling our AWS reps that we care about this and we're annoyed that we're not getting the progress that we're seeing that we would have had we been on Azure or GCP. So yeah, use your wallet to have your say. Tell your AWS reps that you care about this and it needs to go back up the priority list. I feel capable of giving a balanced viewpoint now that I don't work for one of the hyperscalers <laughs> anymore. But I also do, I do work with a partner who partners deep with hyperscalers. So I'm not going to say anything wild. But what I will say is that like it was always like, because I was at Microsoft at the time, like, a couple of years ago, I remember there was an article by Wired, very early days, which ranked the hyperscalers and gave them an A, B, C, D, F score. And I remember Google got B and Microsoft got B plus and Amazon got, hopefully we'll correct, we'll make sure, we'll make sure the right number is here. I think it was like a D or an E or something like that. But th from those days to just recently, they moved, they accelerated very fast. I remember it was not last year, it must have been the year before, I remember that. So they announced... A couple of things, not the last reInvent, the previous reInvent. Is, it, is reInvent every year? Is it every year? Once a year. Yeah. Once a year. So last, not the last reInvent, it wasn't the last previous reInvent. It was the previous one. Yeah. Yeah. They announced that the sustainability content, the WAF content, if I remember rightly, so the well architected framework content. Then almost immediately they teased their cloud carbon footprint calculator. And I tell you right now, I was there thinking, oh, they teased it. We'll wait a year and then, then they'll announce it. And within months, it had come out. Mm -hmm. So I was at the sidelines going, wow, that's. They're really going for it, Amazon. Really impressed. This is excellent work. I chatted to people who are in there and I was very, I was honestly very, very impressed with Amazon's execution in this space. It was happening very rapidly, very fast. I, from what I heard internally, you know, this was actually being driven the way I would, I think it should be driven from within an organization, which is top down. You were getting measured at the leadership level for sustainability commitments which is why it's happening. So it's really sad to me to see an article like this. And I think there was this follow-on conversation with Adrian Cockroft on LinkedIn, which is about it, it, there's cuts happening across the board in tech companies. And I remember I was quite naive at the start of the year. I was thinking no one will touch sustainability, but we're on the chopping block like everything else. I guess if you're only making $300 billion in revenue each year, <laughs> I, go, I don't know how you're possibly going to be able to hire anyone, right? How many hundreds of billions do you need to be earning before you can bring a sustainability team in? For folks who are actually using Amazon and feel a little bit defensive about this, we've also shared a link to some of those sustainability theme sessions at the last AWS reInvent from Adrian Cockcroft's blog. Where he's gone through the, the list of all this and put together a, a number of really interesting and useful ones for this. But this is the thing that, as Anne says, if you were a customer of Amazon, this is probably one thing you could ask for to help a customer-obsessed organization move a bit more quickly on something like this because this is one thing where I think they're quite comfortably behind the other two right now. And given the size, they probably have disproportionate impact. Yeah, so actually, I do want to add something there because this has reminded me of something I'd forgotten about, but it's very relevant to this podcast. One of the things I'm working on at the moment is a book that I can talk about, which is a, a reissue of a book I wrote ooh, about six or seven years ago about cloud native. And it had a lot of case studies in about people who were doing interesting things. And we're just about to reissue. So we've re-updated all the case studies. And one of the case studies is a particularly interesting one from Skyscanner, who are a company in the UK. And what they've been up to recently has been FinOps with a climate twist. So they have been looking at ways to cut their hosting costs and that's mostly been through, they have massively reduced their hosting costs in a large part by using spots 
by moving over to using spots. But the tool that they said, you know, actually, it's like the AWS stuff is better than it used to be, this tooling, but none of it's enough for them to really do a FinOps flywheel improved test. And the tool that they were really, and this is, I've never used this tool, but they were raving about it was something called Cloud Zero. And obviously, I don't know them, I know nothing about them, but that appeared to be what they were using instead of good quality AWS stuff. Basically, there are other tools out there. That, and maybe that's why AWS, and I really want AWS to keep the foot on the gas here, but there might be other tools coming out that do some of the job quite well. Keep your eyes open for other tools. So I'm going to come in here with a question, if that's okay, to put to the two of you. Uh, we have it written here. So let's say you're a customer of a cloud service provider, Amazon, GCP, Azure, maybe OVH or Scaleway. What do you actually need to have access to, to effectively manage the environmental impact of digital services. Like I see my reckon, this was some of the stuff that we were struggling with, the software carbon intensity for figuring out some of the inputs for this. And I'm sure, I reckon you might have some reckons for people to know what to ask for. Yeah, I mean, I remember this being one of our first conversations on it and you were challenged. Yeah, the data, it's data. It's all like the data problem. Like it's been, whether you calculate the standard that we're developing here, which is just for almost an internal metric for teams, the software company, whether you're calculating a greenhouse gas footprint, whether you're doing an LCA, whatever it is, you need data. And the big problem is there's very minimal data that's surfaced to customers. It's not granular enough. The methodologies are challenging to understand how, given the methodology of that calculation, how can it actually be merged and combined with other data sets? So just a lot more transparency around that. And I also understand, I hear it from multiple sides, I understand it. It's sometimes quite challenges for organizations to reveal this data. I've even heard that at some point it's become such a contradiction where you could actually, some lawyers have said you're actually revealing materially non-public information about your company and that'll get you in trouble with the SEC. There's, it's a very complicated space. But the truth through all of that complexity is more transparent data is what we need. So there is one thing I will point you to, and I'll add a link to this, because one of the things I do where I work is we maintain a directory of kind of providers who share some of these numbers. OVH are probably the, one of the largest cloud providers. In 2020, they announced uh, APIs for exposing both energy usage at an instance level, but also embedded carbon usage to figure these out numbers out. So these are the ones that we've been looking for ages for the SEI. And like some providers expose them as part of the service. This is like mind blowing for me when I found that about I've tried to chase it up because I'm not a customer. 2020? In 2020, this was, I'll, I'll find the link. They announced in 2020 or they released it? Was it was announced in 2020. I'll share the link, I'll share the post on LinkedIn where I was asking about it because I'm not a customer myself, so I don't know what the numbers look like. And honestly, this would be game changing if that was actually something that was made available because it's just very difficult for people to actually have access to. And at the moment, most of this is people making educated guesses or using various kinds of modeled approaches which don't necessarily match reality a lot of the time we will have to review that data maybe we should come up with a process of next podcast actually reviewing the data and then coming up with what we conclude rather than just being our guesses right now but i would say one thing that comes up quite often is what we call measurement for reporting and measurement for action and then large again one of the limitations that hyperscalers have is because when they're actually giving that data they're giving you from a reporting perspective which has different constraints and it's not so useful. It's not useful almost at all, I'd say, from a developer perspective or a very limited useful, usefulness from a developer perspective. If OVH are giving that data, hopefully it's providing it at a level of granularity, which is more useful to software practitioners. But I would then question whether or not it's the kind of data which would be approved from a regulator perspective to use new GSG calculations or something. So I think the Skyscanner experience is interesting in that the payoff of moving to spots is financially very impactful. So it's, it, yeah, in some ways, there's just tweaking and tuning a little bit. But if you make a radical change, sometimes that is quite apparent. Yeah, it's going to make it very easy to compare and contrast versus OVH, isn't it? So there's one thing I will just move on, just share one more link for us to maybe discuss at another time. There's a unimaginably titled Green Coding in Berlin. They have a project called Cloud Energy, where they have basically put together some of these modeled ideas for this. Basically, they look at this, the, the machine you're using, make some inferences about the provider, the number of cores and everything you have to give you some numbers for this. And uh, I think they're doing a bunch of really interesting stuff in this field, and they're doing it with a very open license. 
so open that maybe companies might not want to touch. <laughs> They're going AGPL rather than GPL. And uh, some people are okay with that. Some people are, they treat it like it's radioactive. Let's move on to the next story because Asim, we were talking a little bit about the fun that was Web3. And this seems to be a thing that you might have some reckons on. Nori launches a Web3 marketplace ah. for offsets. So the story here is that Nori, a US-based carbon removal marketplace, they've launched a Web3 marketplace specifically to essentially allow people to what they call Nori carbon removal tons. So not NFTs, NRTs. And this seems to be something set up to allow you to purchase an offset and for want of a word, retire and make sure it can't be traded to someone else. That's the idea behind it. And I think this is partly in this has been shared because the Linux Foundation had a recent report on open source sustainable blockchains. And and I think you had some reckons about some of this that I might give some space to you. Or Asim could come in as the good cop to your, <laughs> your inevitable <laughs> things to say here. Yeah, because I would say that blockchain is so horribly tainted with general evil and terrible behavior that I would not want to touch anything associated with it with a 10-foot pole. We were talking last week about greenwashing. And to be honest, there's an awful lot in the financial press about ESGs being effectively ethics washing. And this feels like an attempt to ethics wash some aspects of blockchain. But I think there's the time I think that the stable door has, has truly is open on that one. It's been closed after it's been bolted. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, oh man, this whole space is so complicated because it also gets tainted with the whole blockchain emits lots of emissions aspect of as well. And it also gets tainted with, it's just a wild west of people getting money getting stolen. I got lost in the rabbit hole of watching CoffeeZilla on YouTube. He's this internet detective who just rips into all these nft scams out there in the world but one thing i did actually interview the founder of nori for an old podcast i used to have called the climate fix like quite a few years ago like before i even really knew what an nft was he was describing to me this really complex thing and i was like oh i oh he was explaining it to me but it was linked to what you were saying chris earlier on he introduced me to this whole idea i was actually unaware of the fact that these carbon offset credits can actually sit as a financial asset in your books and be traded, yeah, which was shocking to me. So I couldn't buy some credits this year, claim those credits offset my carbon emissions this year. Next year, sell the same credits to Anne, who could then claim those offsets for next year. But no one goes historically back into my time and then says, well, actually, you don't have those credits for last year's. And so what they were doing with that, I'm not not going into the Web3, but the blockchain aspect of their work was the ability to verify that a credit has been retired and therefore cannot be traded again. So I would buy it and retire it. I then can't sell it. I can buy it, not retire it, sell it to Anne. But if I buy it and retire it, claim those credits against my emissions this year, I then can't sell it again, is my understanding of how it works. That seems like a perfectly reasonable idea, except that, as is always the case with these blockchain things, there are other ways, other cheaper, and it doesn't have to be decentralized. Yeah, gonna... Sometimes centralization is okay. If you had an authority that was saying, yes, that is an okay carbon credit, which arguably we should have, we should have some kind of better standardization of carbon credits. When I read this, the thing I don't quite follow for some so this is where the ultimate source of truth is for lots of these because as i understand it blockchains are good for making sure that if you've put something you can be sure that it hasn't changed because you have this kind of chain of kind of custody you can see what the integrity of it might go all the way back but in many cases the actual kind of carbon removal parts are usually issued by a government somewhere so you're not really trusting a blockchain you're trusting a government but you're, what you're doing is, so in many cases, you, there are a number of schemes where this is actually being issued. You have, you, there is some organization which is issuing these kinds of credits, and then they might be put into a blockchain to then be traded around. That means that I haven't actually got rid of the problem of trust. I'm still trusting an external organization, and I haven't really seen a really convincing way around that when I've seen any kind of blockchain-related tool. I have to be honest, when I've looked at this, I'm still not totally sure who is actually trusting at this point here. And that feels like the thing that's ultimately worth looking into. And if you're interested in this, there is a report. The report is actually that this came from is actually not bad work. It's not a bad read, to be honest. Yeah. 
I think it's unnecessary in this case to do that. You don't need it to be done that way. But the classic example of effective use of immutable ledgers is certificate revocation. Now, in there, you have a trusted authority, which is the authority that issued the certificate that then sits on the immutable ledger. And when it's revoked, everybody can see straight away that it's been revoked. And it means that nobody, for example, the people who no one trusts, which is governments in this case, can't go in and ask around with that certificate without anybody knowing that, that that's happened. So you've got that transparency, you've got the immutability, but you still have the trust of the person. You've still got trust in that system, which is the person who issued the certificate, but you've got protection from the person you're you don't trust, which is the government. So you're right. But in this case, Chris, yeah, the government's in the chain. <laughs> so what's the point? <laughs> I would say one statement, which is when I did interview the founder of Nori a couple of years ago, at the end of my interview, I felt more convinced that they were on the right side. I just can't remember all the points right now. And I would probably link it into the show notes here. They were doing this before there was even a language around this kind of stuff. So they, and I do remember specifically, there was a time I was like, oh my God, yet another climate startup that's using blockchain. Are you just using the keywords to get the funding? And I know that was a feeling for a while as well. And we remember having lots of conversations with people and you dig into it like, this could be a database. <laughs> this could be a database. This isn't these people. But then there were other times, and I think when I had that interview, them, I was like, I remember feeling afterwards, okay, I see the argument for why this is a this particular use case was important. So I will put that caveat out there. But then I'd also say, you shouldn't be asking me too much about blockchain. In fact, we can actually ask them. The folks at Nori maintain a really good, quite an informative podcast. If you are particularly interested in this field, then it's common. It's been going for a good few years. And I actually was introduced to a bunch of quite interesting ideas when I found it, like the carbon take back policy, which was an idea related to oil and gas firms. The idea being that, okay, if an oil and gas firm is going to get some fossil fuels out of the ground, they should be responsible for putting it back in the ground. Like they're able to make some money in the meantime, but they need to take on the actual responsibility to put it back if they're going to do that. And that's the only circumstances by which they're allowed to work. Now, you have an immediate reaction to this. Well, it is an interesting point to make because I was saying that's, that the classic only reasonable use for immutable blockchain is to protect from state level actors like the American government asking around. <laughs> basically, it's basically there to protect protect people from the Amer- from American government asking around with me. I thought the American government was there to bail you out when your bank fails. Yeah, yeah. I thought that's what you're supposed to do when you're with your libertarian projects. I don't think it's controversial. I think everybody knows that immutable blockchain in certificate revocation exists to make sure that no one, no matter how powerful, i.e. the US government, can ask anyone to muck around Uh, with a certificate. Because if they do, it'll be obvious. It's people tying their own hands against their states, people who might be putting pressure on them. Now, obviously, states are state-level actors, but to a certain extent, there are fossil fuel companies that have so much money that they are effectively state-level actors. And in fact, some, the biggest ones, are almost indistinguishable from state-level actors. So to a certain extent, I can see that argument that you might need something super tough to protect everybody from an immutable ledger of some form, not necessarily blockchain, which is not one of the better ones, to protect against some fossil fuel companies who have a load of power. Because if it was a database somewhere, if you had enough power, you can get it changed. Indeed, you can. You've got money to bribe people, to threaten people, to do all kinds of things. The value of immutable blockchain, immutable ledger for certificate revocation is that Mm. you can do it, you can change it, but everyone will be able to see. And I can see potentially that there might be something there if you're protecting against fossil fuel companies. So I just want to say one thing on the next related article to this, which is why the future Web3 needs open source sustainable blockchains, which is a report from Linux Foundation Research, which is my colleagues and Tamara, who's actually joined the foundation, was involved in this as well. One of the specific conclusions in the last paragraph, I think is related to what we're saying, which is There was a deep need for standards and regulation for Web3. The sustainable blockchain space needs standards, transparency and accountability, especially regarding claims about carbon offsets and other efforts to benefit marginalized communities. ESG regulation is making carbon measurement and reporting more important and standardization regulation will help build and shape the Web3 space. I'm all for standardization and I'm all for regulation. So this this is a good conclusion for me. Last word on the report, which is really surprising to me, but a nice surprise. 
this is the first report we've ever seen talking about Web3 that actually talks about climate justice and actually talks about the different kinds of climate justice in there for actually put, bringing that in. She talks about distributive justice, as in who's actually getting the benefits and the downsides, procedural justice, who's actually getting to make the decisions, and then rec recognition, who gets to say their cultures are valid or not valid. So to see that in a report, when in quite a techie report, it's like, wow, this is some kind of STS level stuff, like actually intro actual interesting humanity stuff being added into there. So it's not just total tech solutionism in, in this. And it's probably worth having a quick look if you are new to this and you're looking around there. All right, we're just coming up to 10 minutes uh, left in this. So we might want to talk about some of the coming events, actually, if you folks are okay with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. All right. So I see there's two things, actually. There is QCon London Software Conference uh, at the end of the month. Yeah, so I've helped organize this track because I've been involved in QCon for years and years. And it'll be hosted by Sarah Sue, who is one of the key members of the Green Software Foundation. And our opening speaker will be Sarah Bergman, who is another one of our key GSF folk. We'll also have Holly Cummins, who used to be at IBM and is currently working on Java, I think, is efficiency. Adrian Cockcroft will have a little bit from the financial sector. Goldman Sachs are going to come and talk. Basically, it should be a really very interesting track. So if anybody who's at QCon London, come along to the track, which will be on the last day, on the Wednesday, and say hi to me and Sarah and Sarah. We'll be very pleased to see you. Excellent. That's March the 27th to March the 29th taking place in London. And there is a link to the conference that's taking place if you are prepared to walk out your house and go to an event without a mask on. That's it for our news and events roundup for this week. As part of this format, we have a closing question now that we ask our guests. It's going to be different every week, but this week the question is, if you could only use one sustainable software tool for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Is this a tool that exists or doesn't exist? Because most of them don't exist yet. Come up with the, the oh, perfect, yeah. yeah, the dream. What's your dream tool and doesn't have to exist? My dream tool is easy. It's obvious. I would pick this tool hands down every time. And that tool is a whiteboard. But when it comes to being green and doing any kind of stuff, it's design that really makes a difference. Can you come up with a green design? That will totally swamp any improvements you make in and code efficiency or anything like that. Operationally, what's your design that do your thinking up front and share it and discuss it and come up with the design of your system that will be greener? Yeah, whiteboard, always my favorite tool. Okay, there we have it. Whiteboard is the number one sustainable software tool for Anne Curry. How about you, Asim? Do you know what I was imagining in my head as I was talking? I was imagining like a whiteboard and actually drawing your architecture on it. The whiteboard goes... Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you sure, mate? Oh, it's going to cost you. That kind of whiteboard. That'd be a great whiteboard. That actually. would be a great um, whiteboard. I see the software whiteboard. tool is a whiteboard with a Cockney <laughs> accent, like a taxi driver, <laughs> giving you commentary yeah, as you yeah, design your system. Yeah. Like a sustainable software GPT yeah, it sucks uh, this. surface plugin for, yeah, like. Ah, I wouldn't, ah, I wouldn't pick that choice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I think we're still really early days in in any tooling in this space. I know there are some great tooling. And I, and I spoke about earlier on in this episode, there's the Eco Grader, which came from Mighty Bytes. I think, oh, there's ones that Green Web Foundation makes as well. And there's this tooling, which you can just put in like the URL of a website and it gives you a score. And I think that would be, I've seen the impact of stuff like that, the almost immediate feedback you get from that thing. And in fact, it's about measuring. So we need much, much better tools for measuring. Like you mentioned stuff again, Chris, you mentioned earlier on, there's the Firefox tooling as well. There's lots, I think, of really great tooling that's available right now for the web developer, the front-end experience primarily of a website. There's very limited tooling for everybody else. And I think this is what we need to get to. I think the next stage in all of this is just much better energy measurement tooling that just there are various solutions out there. I want there to be an out of the box solution that works for everybody everywhere, whether you're in a virtualized environment where you're, you're bare metal, it will work if even if you're running on a hyperscaler, whatever it is, it just gives you the numbers. And we are working on something like that in the foundation called the Carbon QL project, which is just getting kicked off. 
but I'm quite excited for where that might head to in the future. Oh, but you like can't ultimate... tease us with that just at the end of the show, I <laughs> seem. Yeah. Well, it's just there's only been two meetings on the project. I can't really announce. Okay, so future, yeah. so what? That's called Carbon QL, and that be something we discuss at a future date. Yeah. Then, yes. Yeah. Carbon QL, Graph QL. And I think that's everything for this episode of This Week in Green Software or The Week in Green Software because we're not sure at what point this week becomes next week or last week. All the resources for this episode and more about the Green Software Foundation are in the show description below if you're visiting this on the Green Software Foundation website. The website for the Green Software Foundation is greensoftware, one word, dot foundation. And if you want to go to the podcast, you can go to podcast.greensoftware.foundation. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. And as ever, if you didn't really enjoy it, please leave a five-star review, but tell us why you didn't, why you wanted to give us a lower score and respond and we'll try harder next time. Your feedback, once again, is very valuable. So please do comment on this. And uh, once again, thanks for listening and see you on the next episode. Ta-ra! Awesome. Goodbye. Bye. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. Just a reminder to follow Environment Variables on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please do leave a rating and review if you like what we're doing. It helps other people discover the show. And of course, we'd love to have more listeners. To find out more about the Green Software Foundation, please visit greensoftware.foundation. That's greensoftware.foundation in any browser. Thanks again and see you in the next episode.